Hi, I'm David Tracy with the Autopian. I'm here with America's car dad, Jay Leno. Yes, that's my car dad, <laughs> car granddad, probably. Well, I was, you know, you know, I didn't want to go with granddad. Granddad's you know. okay. It's all right. All right cool, all right. cool. Um, we're here to talk about cars. All we, right. We run the Autopian. It's a car geek website. Right, right. Uh, Co-founded by Bo Bachman and Jason Torchinsky. Oh, sure, so sure. you know it's going to be geeky. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we asked our readers to come up with some questions. Ah. Um, but first, we're so going to mention. So they're actual readers. They're not listeners or watchers. I actually read the written word. Oh, that's great. It's, well, this is good. it's incredible. I know. Um, actually, we're, we're actually here to, to talk about your show being on Rig TV, which okay. is that's a fast channel that you, you basically you can watch Jay Leno's Garage. Well, you know, we've done 1,100 videos. Yeah. And some just get put off to somewhere because maybe they're obscure or not. So we try to get all those in there, too. So no matter what kind of vehicle you're interested in, we've probably done some version of it. And I'm not saying we've done everything, obviously, but... We kind of pride ourselves. It's fun to do the popular the hypercars and supercars, but just the odd stuff like Tatra and, you know, Volga Goss and all these yep. cars nobody's ever heard of, Panard. There's always the people that seems like, uh, well, if you're watching this, you'd probably be interested. You're in deep. Yeah, you're in yeah. deep at this point. So anyway, whatever you're doing right now, you should consider stopping it and watching on Rig TV or but, YouTube. But don't stop YouTube. right now. Watch If this, you're in the middle of a surgery, you, yeah, you got to yeah, watch yeah, this. Yeah, right. Man, I really screwed myself over there. Anyway. Um, got a bunch of questions from readers. Go ahead. We'll hop right into them. This one is actually from me. It is about the concept of soul. My fiance makes kind of makes fun of me when I say a car has soul. She's like, it's a machine. What do you mean? It's not a living thing. So I'm curious what your thoughts are well, on that. Well, no, I, I, I get that. I mean, I like mechanical watches. I mean, when you have a precision, you know, there's a wonderful book called, I think it's called Perfection by Simon Winchester. It's a book on the history of precision. And it kind of goes way back, and it's written for the layman. It's not some overly mm -hmm. geeky thing. It goes, it covers clocks and watches, anything that was precision. Mm -hmm. And you kind of learn that every village in, in Europe, for example, because they were a little ahead of us here, they had one or two people who were craftsmen. Here's a good example. You ever see the movie um, Quigley Down Under with Tom Selleck? It's a Western, he goes to Australia. He has a rifle. Mm -hmm. And it's a real rifle that was made uh, by a guy that was, he could hit something close to half a mile away in the 1800s. Oh, wow. It was a precision, and this guy made one rifle a year. So not many people had a chance to get many. There's only a mm -hmm. half a dozen of them around. And then, of course, you have Colt and you have uh, uh, Smith & Wesson. Then mass production comes in. Well, there's no reason to have this precision instrument anymore when yeah. anybody can have access to a weapon. You mm -hmm. know? And, it, it, and, and the same thing with clocks and guns. And we went from craftsmen to the Industrial Revolution. And now we're kind of back into craftsmen again, you know? Like in Switzerland, the quartz industry, the quartz watch industry, using battery for watches, decimated Switzerland. I mean, all these craftsmen that made these precision instruments. So is precision a big part of what gives a car that? Well, well, I, I think it, it, because it works like, you know, it's funny because when you go back to the early days of the automobile, if a man could outlast an automobile, like if you drove a car for 12 hours, whoa, that was, you know, I mean, the cars are never going to be better than a man, but the fact yeah. that the car lasted as long as the man, it's like when we were kids, they used to say, or when I was a kid, well, chess players, a machine can play chess, but a computer could never beat a chess master because mm -hmm. it doesn't have the ability to use logic or think ahead or whatever. Well, now it does. Mm -hmm. You know, you have artificial intelligence. And it's sort of the same thing with the automobile. I, I, think, uh, I, I think when you fix something, I always had old cars, and I always prided myself. I was always, always able to get them home. You know, if something happened, I could pull over and, and fix it. Yeah. By that measure, I had to take care of the car, and consequently, I didn't crash and screw up as a lot of my friends did, who go drinking, because the car was just an appliance like anything yeah. else, you know? Right. I mean, the other example I always use, I got a friend of mine who collects Maytag washing machine motors from like, the late 1800s, about 1906. Because that's just time, the motors. No, no what, what happens is the whole thing was exposed. You had the agitator, the ch -ch -ch -ch, and since it was visual, it was brass and copper and nickel, and it was you'd run it and it would, ch -ch -ch -ch, and mm -hmm. it was pleasing to watch. It oh, had yeah. a mechanical thing that you saw. Oh, you know, like steam engines. Yep. You get into those because they're like the heartbeat. Ch -ch 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 -ch. You know, so in, yeah. in that sense, you, if you want to call that the soul, I guess that's what it is. But somebody came along and then put a white box over this motor, called it a washing machine, and suddenly 
the soul it could is just gone. be black steel, yeah. and you know, it, there's no reason to. Why would you want to look at it? But when you opened up, it was like, like the back of a watch. Yeah, mm. sort of the mecha the mechanical intricacies, the precision. Yeah, that's a big yeah. part of the soul. Yeah, I was reading the Beverly Hills Courier interview. Uh, Very was, Beverly Hills Courier. You okay. and Bruce Meyer uh, were were interviewed, and you mentioned <laughs> how much you love noble failures. Yes, I love noble failures. Um, so using some examples from Jay Leno's Garage, like what are, what are like your top noble failures? First off, what is a noble failure? The greatest noble failure is the noble steam car because it is steam, it's a steam car. You get in, you turn a key, and then you pull away. Now most steam cars, you have to get under it, light the pilot, wait for it to heat up, just a lot of things to do. So you get this would you get outwardly seem like a clear up. improvement. A, a clear improvement. But the trouble is it didn't come along until 1924, 25. Now, Abner Doble had been building steam cars, and in that time, the internal combustion engine, the self-starter is really what put steam engines out of business. Because the steam engine, you could light the pilot, let it heat up, go in, have a cup of coffee, have your breakfast. When you come out, oh, everything's warm, and you can pull away. Because you, you, the pilot heats the gasoline and turns this from a liquid into a gaseous state, mm -hmm. and under pressure, under whew, this gas is pushed into the boiler, and it lights, okay. Okay, well, with a, a gas car at that time, you had, to get a, you had to set the choke, set the mag, pull it. Mm -hmm. Maybe it would start, maybe it wouldn't, but it could also break your arm if it kicked back. So that, that happened a lot. Yeah. When the self-starter came in, that pretty much put every other form of car. The electric car was okay, but most people did not have electricity in their house. Mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, the, New York had hundreds of electric taxis, 1906, seven. In fact, 1907, a third of the market was steam, a third was electricity, and a third was this newfangled internal combustion. And they, they honestly didn't know which one would win. Mm. You know, it's like now, I think you're gonna see hydrogen make a big swing back into the game all of a sudden. It does seem to be, like a lot of European automakers seem to like it, and yeah, Japanese yeah. automakers too. Yeah, yeah, so you, you never quite know where it's gonna go. I drove a, uh, I think it was a Toyota Mirai. I was at the uh, hydrogen pump and I interviewed this lady who was filling her car up. She said, I got this thing for a smoking deal. I got six years worth of free hydrogen. Yeah, you get free fuel for six years. But now the, high, the free fuel is gone and she's paying an unbelievable amount of money to, to fill right. up her car. And it's, right, yeah, that's, that, that's the problem. Yeah. So. Uh, I don't know if that would be a noble failure. Yeah. But uh, I mean, yeah. We I, love noble failures at the October. Well, I, mean, I think a noble failure also is a car that's better than it needed to be to sell. Yep. You know, the Tucker. genius of Lee Iacocca was the Mustang came along and everybody went independent suspension. He said, no, just put it in the Falcon. It was Falcon engine, Falcon engine. Make it look good, make it convertible, make it a sexy look. Yep. Offer good You know, beat. short, dead, long hood. But, uh, and, and you'll sell a million of them. And he did. In fact, independent suspension didn't come along for almost 40 years. For poor, I mean- In the rear, right? Yeah, M yeah. Mustang, they offered it, I don't want people. I don't want that because most people drag crazy like yeah. solid mm -hmm. axles right. will burn out, you know. Yeah. Uh, so they didn't really want it. It wasn't until 2015 when they came out with the 350R, yeah. which is just a phenomenal automobile. I mean, it's finally a real sports car mm -hmm. at that point. But yeah, you have to kind of wait for things to catch up. But so a noble failure would be that. Another noble failure would be Duesenberg. I mean, a Duesenberg would be the equivalent now of a Bugatti Chiron or one of those cars. Yeah. I mean, I have a Duesenberg down there. It was $27,000 in 1933. Ford was $260. House money probably. I mean, it was fast. It was, you ever hear of uh, Will St. Clair? Will St. Clair was Henry Ford's um, partner. They split everything 50-50. Henry Ford was not a cheapskate, but he didn't like to give credit. Mm. Like, Will's invented, uh, he developed the vanadium steel. Uh, the steel beam headlight, he did the Ford logo, the blue oval, which they still use. He, did, yeah. he designed the uh, planetary transmission, which revolutionized the, the Model T. And he and, and like everybody else was him, they had a big fight. No, you know, you, you go screw yourself, blah, blah. So he started his own company, the Will St. Clair Car Company. I have one of his cars. Overhead cam, oh. bevel drive to overhead cam. Interesting. Declutching fan, no gear driven belt, no belts, no leather belts, no rubber. Everything is gear driven. Huh. And he showed Loud, me. I assume. Everything being gear driven. No, no, very quiet. Oh, it is, yeah, really? No, no, it's, it's, and he showed it to Henry Ford, and Henry Ford said to him, nobody wants to go 70 miles an hour. Which they didn't in 19, in the 20s, the roads were all, I mean, 
the speed limit was 18 still in many places, and 45 was, oh my God, it seems the worst. Yeah, yeah. And he did pretty good for a, a short time, but he was a very nice guy. He had free housing for his workers and free health care, and mm -hmm. the car was $4,000 in the 20s, and he sold quite a few of them. But much like electric cars today, everybody that wants one got one. The rest of the people don't want one. Now we're, what are we doing with it? Yeah. And it, it, yeah. it went out of business. So that, that would be a noble thing. Yeah, that's great. I, I drive a modern noble failure. What is that? It's a car that, and this is another question I have. It's a car that nobody really gets. I am obsessed with it. RX-8? It's, no, it's a modern, it's a BMW i3, which is a carbon fiber little. Uh, uh, oh. I know, nobody gets it. I know, exactly. But it was a car that was way too expensive. They made it out of carbon fiber. Nobody wanted it. Little city car. Yeah, but, um, it, it looks a little, I, I don't, I have like to admit, I, I am somewhat perplexed by BMW styling. To me, in the 80s and the 70s, I thought the 2000 Ti, the mm -hmm. CLS Coupe, I thought they had the most beautiful car. Now yeah. they have this, looks like a hotmobile stuck in a lemon, this big... Now big, it's getting really crazy big, with the fangs, almost look the like big, fangs in yeah, the front. I don't get yeah. it. I, I don't understand the steering, the, the, the design element there. And, you know, the idea of making the dashboard look like the check-in desk at the high end, a big piece of wood across. I like gauges, I like things. So to me, I don't, but I, apparently I'm wrong because it sells quite quite popular well, but your car now that was probably more expensive than it needed to be too it was it? way too it was i right. mean it was like fifty seven thousand dollars right. i mean it's a, especially in the u.s a small car is we don't spend a lot of money on small cars nowadays right. and uh well i for american manufacturers it costs the same amount of money to make a small car as it does a big car it's yeah. like a tv show why make a half hour show when for a few dollars more you can do an hour show and get twice as much revenue. Yep, exactly. Know. So people looked at that car and they're like, okay, I don't really care that it's carbon fiber. I don't right. care that it has a little scooter engine under the rear floor acting right. as a generator. There's a lot of weird stuff, suicide doors. No, it's, people didn't it, really it's care about that. It'll probably be a collectible car, but sadly it'll long be dead by the time. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Sadly. Well, I'm curious, do you have a car that you're really into that really nobody really Yes, I have a wonderful about? car called a Panard. It's, it's, uh, it's right over there. Uh, that blue one down there, oh, yeah. twenty four. Mm -hmm. Now, Panard, why? Well, I was admiring that on the way in, for the, the record. French are quirky. It's two cylinders. It's 850cc, 94 mile an hour top speed. You've got um, torsion valve, valve spray. I mean, it's two cylinders. It, it, it 94? Out of 94 a little horsepower. two cylinder? Yeah, yeah, it's very fast. That's great. And it's so much fun. It just revs all day long. It's, it's fun to drive. But the French, they, they're just sort of quirky. You know, they. Everybody else in Europe is two millimeter, four millimeter, six millimeter, eight millimeter. The French are five millimeter, seven millimeter. But that, that is part of soul of a car, I right, think. Right, weirdness right. is part of it. Right, We're weird. Well, it's weirdness to us, you know, because in France, like Citroën was developed in Paris. You know, every other automaker, it's Detroit, it's Stuttgart, it's dirty, industrial, gritty yeah. cities. Way in Paris, oh, the city of light. You yeah, know? I know. So yeah. the cars are very light and airy, and they drive wonderful, and they have odd things. So, like on, on most French cars in the 30s, you pull the light switch out to turn it off. Like when I get in my French cars. Really? Yeah, you turn it off. Like in most cars, the key goes in straight, you turn it this way, and it's ignition. The yeah. French car, you put it in this way, and you turn it up, which would be off. So a lot of times- But that's so perfect, you, I love that. Yeah, you leave your lights on <laughs> and the ignition on. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah. Hilarious. Yeah, I mean, being different is, is I think, half of the game when it comes to you know, the appeal of a well, car. Well, it's, it's great if you're an engineer or you're a, a nerd type person. It's not good if you're the average, because the average person wants to get in the car, and not turn think. the key, press it. That's they're, right. They're not gonna read the instruction book. I'll, I'll tell you a story. Well, I'm going up Coldwater Canyon one day. I see a guy in a 7 Series BMW with a flat tire. So I stop, and he's there with his girlfriend, you know. What's up? I've got a flat, you know. I said, you want to change it? He goes, well, you can't. There's no way to get the wheel off. I said, well, yeah, yeah, it is. And he looks at the wheel, and it's, it, it, it's a disc kind of covering the, the oh, lug okay. nuts, you know? center, center. He says, there's no way to get that off. And I said, well, open your glove box. You got a flat I said, there should be a little tool in your owner's manual. Okay, now he's had the car like you, or you take the owner's manual, it's still sealed, it's never been open. <laughs> yeah. There's the thing, watch, so you pop it up, and there's the lug nuts, you go, oh, no. I said, now your spare tire, here's your jack, and we change it, you know, and he's, oh, this is, okay. And his wife is looking at me like I'm Superman, oh, a real man is coming <laughs> up. You know, I'm thinking, I'm sure he loved but that. He, but he loved the car, but he just didn't, 
know anything. You know, if your dad didn't grow up, grow up using a screwdriver, you probably don't know how to use one. You know, so you have a whole generation that never had to fix a car. So consequently, they're not that into it in terms mm -hmm. of finding the soul of the automobile. Yeah. You know, we, we had a reader ask kind of your thoughts on, um, well, the reader noticed that a lot of the people doing starter motor repairs and speedometer repairs and, you know, people bending U-bolts for, for leaf springs, a lot of those are kind of an old, the older generation. Right. Uh, and I'm wondering, wh where do you see car culture going? Well, I, you know, you have things like McPherson College, where you get a four-year degree in automobile restoration. The interesting thing about the capitalist system is when something becomes valuable, it becomes worthwhile. You know, when I was a kid, you could buy a wrecked Jaguar for 800 and a wrecked Aston Martin for maybe 1200 I mean, they weren't, they were just old sports. My Lamborghini Mirror, the yellow one I have here, I got for free because the engine was blown and it wasn't worth anything and nobody spoke Italian and you couldn't call Lamborghini in Italy, it was a little factory. I mean, I met guys over the years who tried to put a 283 Chevy in it and all this kind of stuff, you know. So, Wild. but now as things go up in value, suddenly automobile restoration is almost the same as restoring the old masters, the, you know, Van Gogh and the painting, people that can put in, fill it in to, without disturbing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's the same thing. When you, a college like McPherson, they teach the old way paint was applied, how to fix magnetos, how to fix it. So we're getting back to the era of the craftsman again, because Good. now the craftsman, it's like watchmakers, an electronic watch that is, doesn't lose any time at all over a year, $25, $50. But a mechanical watch does the same thing, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars, mm. you know. But if you like the mechanicalness of it, you know. Like right. I like skeleton watches, I'm not wearing one now, but that's a watch where you can see through it and you see how the whole thing goes together. Jason Torchinsky wanted me to ask you. Yeah. He didn't even have a specific question, but he just wants you to say something about the Briggs and Stratton hybrid car, that car that he sourced a while ago, that oh, yeah, yeah, six-wheel yeah, ridiculous you know, it, thing. It's, it's interesting. You know, you, you, you kind of have to uh, thank Elon for this, for making the electric car. Because when I was a kid, an electric car was a golf car. And if you build an electric car, oh, it's, oh, it's nice, but it's kind of silly. You go down, maybe go down to the market and come back. Oh, and you're out of battery and you got to charge it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea of, a, of an electric car being fast was unheard of until the Tesla came along. So the Briggs and Stratton was always seen as something of a toy. And it was, I guess, you know, you have to look at the 1960s as sort of the halfway point in the development of the automobile. I mean, although it started in the 1800s, figure 1910 is when, okay, Model T coming out of, really, okay, figure 1910 to now. So 1960s would be the halfway point. And that Briggs and Stratton is sort of the halfway point. It's like you're taking, it, it used, I think it used a little like a single cylinder motor to run the generator to run the car. You know, I have a car called an Owen Magnetic, which is 1960. And that uses an Ents electric transmission developed by Westinghouse. It's a gas engine. At the end of the crankshaft, you have a horseshoe magnet, the armature of the transmission with it. Yeah, so it just goes around, creates electricity. So it's an electric car that runs on gasoline. Since, most, since gasoline was way more plentiful than electricity yeah. in the turn of the century, it's a call the car of a thousand speeds because when you get on the road, it kind of does this. You know, when you have opposing magnets, you know, where you put them in there, they're kind of Yep. And it, it feels like, it, but, but it's such an odd sensation, but it, it's smooth, it's fast, and you've always got plenty of power. You know? So I'm getting a wrap-up signal. I'd like to ask you one last question. Sure. Just having fun. we got to go. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so as a car journalist, the question I always get asked is... Um, What's your favorite car? I well, not that. that. It, well, yes. But, you know, we obviously are huge fans of car culture, but mm -hmm. there, are, there are obviously problems that cars create in this world, right? You know, emissions, their car crashes, their infrastructure issues. And people always ask me, what makes car culture worth preserving and promoting? And for me, it's about cars' ability to bring people together. It really is a great equalizer. Well, the ability in to, you know, they always used to say, travel is the enemy of bigotry. Because when you can go places, you realize, you know, when I go to the Middle East, well, here's an example, I never saw Muslim children laughing. You just don't see it on TV. You don't, I mean, having fun being silly. Yeah. I was in, I'm in the Iranian Mustang Club. Cool. Because there's really? a bunch of Iranian <laughs> guys that love Mustangs. 
And when you talk to them, it just does. It's the same thing. I mean, it's, right. you know, all you know, when you live in little areas, and you have this myopic view of the world that I'm only electric, I'm only this, I'm only this. But it does open you up to sort of the the world view. What was the question again? I forgot. It was, why car cultures were saving? Oh, why it's a saving? You know, nothing makes me laugh more than the idea of like these bird scooters. You just leave them. Like you get a rent a car, you just leave it somewhere, and someone else will pick it up. Yeah, and they got to clear all the beer cans out of it. And the, people abuse things that they don't own. They it's just true. do. Yeah. You go to a hotel. You don't make the bed when you leave. Yeah. So everything is mm, towel. Yeah. You know, you steal a towel. At best, you leave a couple bucks on the night. Yeah, stand. yeah, at best, right, right. Uh, you know that type of thing. And so, when something belongs to someone that has a sense of worth and that has a sense of purpose to be here, well, I have this car which will allow me to go get food to feed my family. But I can also, as I become more prosperous, I want to go for a drive. Let's make a convertible. Yeah, you know. So I, I, I think it, I think it'll be around for a long time. The fun thing about now is that the internet, no matter what you're into, there are thousands of people in, in it, you know. Yeah, I mean, I had some, this line, I know you collect buttons. I, I, I don't, they're starting with the premise, and they send me all these pictures of all kinds of different kind of buttons. Like, I, I really don't collect buttons, but I'm glad you do, you know. But, but, so no matter what you're interested in. So you find I, a community, yeah. Yeah, you find a community for it, yeah. yeah. The most obscure automobile, there's a club for it. My favorite is the Tatra Club. I, I have a Tatra, which is a Czechoslovakian club. Oh, yeah, those are... Incredible. Fabulous car. So I see in an English magazine, Tatra Club, join the Tatra Club, exclamation point. Uh, Christmas party, magazine, spare, spare Probably lots of folks spare in that scheme, club. You know, blah, blah, blah. Oh, okay. So I call the guy, and, oh, he's saying, I've got to tell you, oh, yeah, I love this car, cheer. He said, yes, yes. I said, I'd like to join the club. Yes, no problem. It's, you know, 80 pounds a year, whatever it might be. I said, uh, how many people in the club? Uh, counting you, four. I go, <laughs> nice. four? I said, how, how, big is that, how big is that Christmas? You see, you got a Christmas party. Yes, we have a get-together. What a, what a party that was, yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just, it just made me laugh. Well, that's great. Well, thanks for your time. Well, thanks. Um, watch Jay Leno's Garage on Rig TV. You can find on it Rig on TV and a bunch of others. And, but it's just, uh, I think people will like it. It's really about cars. We have seven years' worth of Jay Leno's Garage on there as well. Uh, and there are a few celebrities in there, if you like that type oh, of thing. Of course. But mostly, it, it's, it's just about different automobiles and things like that. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate Thanks. it. Even though Jay had other interviews to attend to, he decided to go a bit over time to show me a couple of things. Jay has a way of making fellow car people completely forget that he's an ultra-influential celebrity. He just wants to talk about car history and engineering, and it's clear he's delighted when he finds someone who shares his passion. Here's that Will Sinclair. Look at this motor. Wow. That's 1919 double drive overhead cam. Great. Based on the Spano Suiza engine designed by Mark Burkett for the spot aircraft. So that's a cast that's a cast aluminum block there? Cast aluminum block. See, most cars this period they had out impressive looking bodies, which is a big flat Model A type styling. It's a sophisticated engine, which is very cool. That's really awesome. I'm sure you can get parts for that thing and up the, down the street. You shoot on that side. This is a great car. Stutz Bearcat. If you said I have a car where the fender is higher than the body, what the fuck? Look at the, look at the back. You're right. There aren't a whole lot of cars that fit in that category. You would have this like this. Even there. See the crown is at the top and it's. No surprise. You'd have a, the most car watch there is. You ever see this? This is a car that can't overheat. They use these in the Death Valley. Franklin air cooled. Oh yeah, yeah, I've heard about these. Yeah. Crazy. These are, just, these are just fins, just right all around the cylinders, huh? Well, no. You see, this this has gotten hard, but it's a rubber seal. The flywheel is also a turbine fan, which sucks air in. Oh wow. It comes in through here and goes down in each cylinder. Love that. Where are we going? I was just wondering if I could crank up, hand crank a Model T, break an arm. Question: um, You know those copper cooled engines that GM was working on yeah, back yeah. in the day? Do any of those exist? Oh yeah, there's plenty of those. Oh, oh there, there, okay. Plenty of those around. Yeah. I'll tell you what. Let me. Let me start it, and okay. then, then you can crank it. That way it's, yeah, ready to rock. All right, folks, I'm about to learn how to hand crank a car from the GOAT. This is awesome. I'm going to start this in about six months. I'll see what you got. She wants to go. You don't need a battery or anything for Model T. 
Thumb inside. And pull hey. it up. Don't be afraid of it, son. <laughs> okay. Thumb inside. Is this the inside? Yeah, you got it, you know, like that. So what you're, like this? You don't want it to kick around and hit an appendage that's sticking okay. out. Okay. So like so this is fine. Keep it nice and inside. Yep. Oh. Here we go. I got to push it in. Just had to push it in a little bit. Come on. It's going well, folks. There it is. There it is, right? Okay. So, then so you got to push it in. It was just not a You got to push it in. Yep. Oh, came undone. Nice. <laughs> wow. That was awesome. It didn't require a whole lot of... Well. I like a higher compression engine. That's where it gets. I bet. Oh, you know, what do you have? A Pierce Arrow. It's 14 and a half liters. Well, my life has been um, forever altered thanks to this experience. Thank you very much. Well, these are wonderful cars. And they're not expensive still. Model well, there's T's. Still, there's, still a middle, uh, there's still a million Model T's on the road. All right, I've gone over time. Thanks again. Okay. Thanks so much no for your problem. time. Thanks, you guys. Thanks. Hey, Thank really you. This was awesome. You. Really nice to meet you, too. Yeah. yeah. Till Thank next time. So Thank you. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Collaborate again in the future. Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you. Thank you, Jay.